Hello everyone. Welcome back to Let's Play Portal, the 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. This is the Amiga version, and this is my 17th time sitting down with the game game like experience of uh, of Portal. I do recommend checking out the playlist of previous streams and videos if you would like to know what has transpired up to this point. I'm recording quite soon after having recorded the previous episode, um, as things seem to be uh, accelerating somewhat. There certainly would seem to be a lot more dramatic tension in the last uh, section of narrative that we read, as um, I'd say more between the intentions of Homer, who is narrating this story to us, and I suppose the um, whether the crux of the story is going to be, because that's what we've been holding out for all this time, as to, to what exactly has happened to the world economic trends. Well, that's not exactly what I was thinking of, but let's read about it. Or oh, are we going to get um, some stock data? Oh, uh, this is interesting. I guess that might be some three-dimensional stock data. General Science and Technology Information. Current Entry. World Econ Trends. Ref Sable, Regent, Kowloon. Vesla Graph indicates spikes in new supply, consumer goods, general well-being. Mind for activity, parentheses, far right, shows decrease with lessened Antarctic threat. Population, parentheses, far left, shows stabilising trend since last report. Okay. So the rest of the world is is doing okay? Spikes in new supply, consumer goods, general well-being. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought we'd be coming back to what would be happening in the wider context of the outside world. I thought we were going to hone our focus in on Peter DeVore, um, friends, and, and their big plan. Um, but... World Mozart epidemic. Well, there you go. We've got we've got the uh, we've got the title of uh, today's episode, haven't we? Oh my goodness, the World Mozart epidemic. Okay, let's read it. Oh, there better be a good picture with this one. Oh, it's a corrupty Homer. Okay. All right, here we go. Brace yourselves, folks. World Mozart Epidemic By 2089, an epidemic of Mozart addiction grew widespread. Sociometric and trend analysis indicated root causes in alienation, anomie, I'll have to look that one up, and individual despair over the stifling sameness of the world. This despite repeated efforts at enforcing mandated ethnic and cultural differences. <laughs> mandated right? It was feared by a majority of the world population that there was, literally, nothing to live for. As an aside, this also may reveal, to some extent, why there was no more resistance to the migration when it arrived. Personal monitor statistics show that over 72% of the world population spent more than 50% of their individual free time under Mozart. Full sensory and experiential induction meant these people were in another, invented mental space, despite the availability of real-time experience through other channels. Intercorp Council was at a loss to understand this flight into fantasy. After all, Intercorp management of the world was benign and allowed for great personal freedom of action and expression, yet a vast majority did flee into the Mozart experience which forced production of inferior and hastily conceived Mozart experiences. These experiences were deplored by artistic and social critics as sentimental and escapist, but nothing they did put on the nets they put out on the nets had any discernible impact on their popularity. So uh, Mozarting in the context of this world is uh, um, like a, a virtual reality experience, but uh, kind of a, um, I guess, almost elitist uh, curated uh, version of that. 
Um, and it seems like as people have been turned to this form of escapist entertainment, there's been a demand for, for much more of it and uh, clearly the, they perceive the quality has gone down. Strange, that's not, that's not the sort of thing that usually happens to art forms. There we go. I well, so far I'm I'm having a, a blast reading the entries today. Let's see if military's got any uh, any cute little tidbits for us. No, not today. All oh, right. Well, in that case, we need to turn to life support, and we need to close in on the end of this list of characters. We're up to Tabitha Ayaba. Let's find out about Tabitha. Signed female, born on the 15th of September 2044 in Springfield. Let's have a look at Tabitha Ayala's blood pressure. There we go. And then we'll have a look at temperature. Mm, escalating. Uh, respiratory and GSR. There. Heart rate and EEG. Tension. Lovely. Uh, DNA on, and hormones. Neurotransmitters. Okay, doing the usual neurotransmitter things. And glycogen. There we go. Okay, lovely. So I will just write down on my notepad here that we're currently on Tabitha. That's not quite the right key. There we go, lovely. And then back into the game. Uh, right, so we will head on to Geography, I believe. And who knows what might await us there. I suspect we've We've probably unlocked everything we're going to unlock before we get back to Homer, I would imagine. No! Ooh, route to Terminus! Yeah? Lay it on me! Uh, preferably with an illustration, if that's possible. Uh, data crystal failure, no. Okay. Oh! Interesting. So the, the reference is for an image. Uh, as we've had before, but we don't get the image. So it says terminus cross section. Terminus cross section schematic based on central processing probe hash 29898 gamma 3 report matrix June the 1st 2106. Interesting, unusual. It's normally when it's uh, basically just the filing entry for a um, uh, a visual document, we get the visual document. Well, you never know that, so the reference to central processing document may be available and that may have something more useful for us. Either that or that was a little subtle bit of um, uh, storytelling there that, that Homer had um, had had a hand in uh, what we were looking at there. Okay, let's turn to Tabitha's uh, Wasatch record. So we could have a look at Tabitha's family tree. Okay, Tabitha Ayala is the child of Bobaloo Ayala and Raz Ayala. Definitely a lot of these names are occurring qu quite a lot. Um, I guess uh, I guess they're going for the overall feeling of um, homogeneity, much as the um, the Mozart addicts have been uh, been experiencing in their grand malaise. So Raz Ayala is the child of Greg Ayala and Corin Ayala, and Bobaloo Ayala is the child of Scotty Chin and Joyce Chin. Let's have a look at Tabitha's physiology and ESP uh, assessment. There we are. Um, pretty good on the slow switch muscles there. Uh, basic core IQ stats for this particular section are as follows. There we are. Okay, so now we're, we're plunging straight back into more stats in psychology. Just 
head down to the right entry here. Okay, emotion. Personal growth. He's all looking on the low side uh, compared to other characters. Um, and these all categories are all look fairly reasonably um, well developed. There we go. All right. Well, no, I don't head back to the list. I want to head back to the main menu to have a look at central processing. Okay. So we're going to get that um, root determinus reference here. We're not. No. All right then. Um, last look at the stats for Tabitha in Edmod. Pop down to Tabitha there. All right, I'm going to start with memory this time. Treat myself. There we are. Uh, none of those um, especially high. Uh, social adjustment. There we go, it's pretty uniform. Uh, logic. Uh, again, pretty uniform. And the final set of basic core IQ stats are as follows. There we go. More into art and music than linguistics and writing by the looks of it. Okay, so we we've wound up back at home again. So let's see what this little bit of um, world context is unlocked in Homer. Well, at least a couple of chunks. We've got a Regent Sable. Um, I was kind of hoping we might be done with Regent Sable. Uh, not, not the most uh, compelling character I found. What of Protector Regent Sable, though? Did he not still want to stop Peter and the others? His fear had not been lessened by the defeat on the Ross Shelf. They had drifted slowly out to the edge of the up of the pack ice. Rescue was slow, although certainly Sable was one of the first off. He rested at the parkland at Kwantong, overlooking Kowloon near what had once been the bustling city of Hong Kong. A few pleasure craft sailed serenely on the calm waters. The sun shone. The world turned. Life continues in its steady course, yet Sable felt unease for the threat he knew grew on the globe's far underbelly. A projection to his left, a man with a green feather crest, reassured him that the new Antarctic treaty was holding, that the recent threat from the pole was substantially reduced, and that no further actions were contemplated in that region. The man moved to his own left, revealed a projection within the projection, scaled up a list of world economic trends in a 3D graph form. The graph rotated, supply grew, well-being grew, consumer goods grew. The mind wars, that short spire to the far right, were lessening with the Antarctic threat. New countermeasures against the terrible mind wars neurophage weapons were under development and would be increasingly effective as more and more citizens were outfitted with these measures. A simple pill, a short course of neuronal treatment, a modification to the personal monitor, that's all it would take. The wars would die out. World population figures, falling so alarmingly in recent years, were stabilising. Future projections indicated a slight rise as the millennium approached with levels at close to 3 billion. Regent Sable stood up impatiently. Damn, he said. Aleph looked up from her Mozart console. What's that, Reggie? You shouldn't do that so much. You'll lose your mind in there. Don't be silly, she said, replacing the probes. He gestured, and the green-crested man and his charts and graphs disappeared. Damn, he repeated more softly. Then he established contact with Raz Hajam. Yes, Protector? Hajam smiled. There are two particle beam generators at LP3. Hajam raised an eyebrow. Yes? We're going to use them. Then we're going to take some social measures. 
and I want a research team immediately. We'll recreate Peter's research step by step. Maybe we can still stop him. Oh, okay. So Regent's Regent's not out of the not out of the narrative yet. We can't uh we can't sprint for the finish yet, friends. Okay, so it's LM uh something in the back of my mind is telling me I know who LM is, but let's have a look. Oh, is it Larian looking into the depths of Terminus? That would be good. At first, she saw nothing unusual. She looked down onto the tops of clouds and thought it was only the strange ground fog that sometimes hovered over the ice or filled the crevasses. Yet looking up, it seemed the ice sloped away from her, that she had fallen through a thin layer of ice into a cavern as large as a world. As she turned at the end of her safety line, she saw a full panorama. Looking up, she could see the sky, deepening to lustrous violet as the sun dipped below the horizon somewhere out of sight. A star glittered there, directly overhead, visible through the irregular crack in the ceiling. She could almost touch the sides of this crevasse, which should have narrowed beneath her feet, should have trapped her, wedged her, gripped her in its icy hold. Yet there was, beneath her feet, an awesome sensation of space, and the crevasse did not narrow, but sloped away. Her line jerked and she began to rise as the others pulled her up. She shouted, Wait! The line stopped. Peter called down to her. There's something here, she said, and there was a pause, vague voices conferring. Then Peter himself lowered to her side. She reached across and gripped his mittened hand. He squeezed back and together they looked down, past their feet at the tops of cloud far below, at the ice sheet sloping away. As they watched, the clouds broke up a little, giving a glimpse of what lay below. Beneath all that blue-green ice, an orange-red light flickered. A dark landscape appeared, a, a patchwork of dark green and black, a thread of silver blue. Then the clouds closed in again. Take us up, Peter said softly, after a long silence. I've never seen ice like that, Laren said. She leaned against the side of the sestrugi, chewing on a concentrate bar. It was black, green and black, and the light, it's orange. Overhead, the aurora flared and shimmered. The vast curtains of light shook gently as if the gods were waving them back and forth in slow motion. Inside, seams and rivulets crawled, changed colour and course, leaped and died. Not ice, Peter said. What is it then? Shem asked. Forest, a river, terminus. That's not possible, it's a dry valley. Dry, nothing can grow down there. It's too cold, too barren. There was doubt in Shem's voice, though, and doubt that could be seen in his eyes behind the lenses. It's there. Okay, Shem conceded, it's there. How do we get down? Okay, well... I guess this is all still still narrative... Oh, narrative progress, okay. Homer's got a narrative one section to show us. Our probes dropped right down out of the sky, on wings of magnetic flux. But this option was not open to Peter and his group. They had to find another way down, and the difficulties were great. The ceiling of Terminus was 9,000 feet above the valley floor. From the crack in that ceiling, they could not measure the extent of the dry valley that was Terminus, except to note that it had walls of ice two miles high, and a ceiling of ice with one small crack open to Earth's own sweet heavens, and was lit by fires yet undetermined. So they huddled at that small opening and pondered. Peter called for an accounting of all equipment. They had monofilament tents and rations yet, and night vision and glow lamps. They had high-strength safety line, but far less than 9,000 feet of it. They had portable computation devices, hollow cameras, medical kits with full-scan diagnostics, all-weather gear, and lazing construction guns of limited range and power. 
they had as well a new adipose layer that protected them from cold, and polarising membranes for their eyes, and they had their minds and educations. Peter said this should be enough. Okay, I guess this is all they've got, isn't it? Anything else? Stop yet. Okay, so we're not gonna we're not gonna have a nice um convenient narrative time jump. I think we're gonna have to we're gonna have to struggle our way forwards again. So in that vein and with that thought, let's head for another round through these databases and see what has emerged since last time. Nothing new in Med 10. How about signing? No, nothing there. Sci tech. And yep. History. Ooh, Terminus Sorel Report, Summary 1. So perhaps some of those, uh, those lost details might be trickling back in. Let's see if we can uh, get any... No, no new image there. Okay. Terminus Sorel Report Summary. One may summon the account of Jules Sorel's sighting of Terminus on the portable datapad and the green hollow crawls with lines depicting the route of the expedition, profiles of ice and bedrock, triangulation fixes of their relative position on various dates, alphanumeric data relating to their research. In the ancient hollow, hollows, in the ancient hollows, Sorel's voice crackled as he recorded his notes. He had moved away from the main body of the transantarctic safari to conduct some radioglaciological soundings of the ice pack, this had been common practice since the 1950s for individual scientists to establish small bases for a few days. It was fall summer in 2012. A slight all-terrain vehicle accident caused Sorel, as leader, to call a temporary halt for rescue and survey work. They were in sight of a nun attack, the peak of a vast mountain buried in the ice. As a part-time radioglaciologist, he wanted to do his own soundings, and so, with a small crawler, and his radar equipment, he headed southwest. Two days later, he camped in an endless sea of sastrugi, took his compass and triangulation recordings, and settled to measure the ice. Wind was light, and the air was clear when he set up his equipment, little more than a primitive radar scanner facing down at the surface of the earth. He took a scan, moved his equipment, took another. It was painstaking routine work, a repetitive job that demanded total concentration, for he must measure and triangulate every move of the equipment. He didn't even notice the storm coming until it was upon him. He lived with the sound of wind, the tongue of it at his clothing, and there was little change in its effects to attract his attention. It was only when the light suddenly failed that he looked up from his most recent sounding. Clouds swept impossibly fast over the milky blue sky, bringing darkness and bitter cold. He turned away from his equipment for a moment, leaving it to complete a pass of its slow, low-frequency radar while he secured his crawler. When he returned, the pass was complete and the equipment indicated a ready state. He decided to try one more move before buttoning down for the storm, which should not last long in this season. So, okay, that was quite long and relatively detailed, and unnecessary information at this point. Um, so, thanks, Kim. Right, military. Um, when, uh, unless it's about the LP5's laser beams or whatever. Um, that's probably not going to push us any further forwards. No. Alright, well we're back to life support, so let's...
take the uh, vicissitudes of this storyline to have a look at the details for Trixie Chin. Okay, assigned female, Trixie Chin was born on the 14th of January 2056. Um, and we will have a look at Trixie's blood pressure. There we are, and also temperature. Respiratory and GSR. There we are. Heart rate and EEG. Tension. Wonderful. DNA and hormones. Neurotransmitters. Glycogen M. There we are. And I will move this back to the main menu and write down Trixie's name here. Lovely. Back to the game window there. Uh, we'll check out geography. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion we've probably found the one entry that we're going to be graced with this um, this round through the database. But never though, there might be a might be a central processing something or other for us to, to read. Okay, let's have a look at Trixie Jin's records in Wasatch. Okay, family tree. We are so Trixie Chin is the child of Edward Chin and Ka Carrie Chin. Edward Chin is the child of Paula Chin and Jules Chin. And Carrie Chin is the child of Barney Hoskins and Susan Hoskins. Let's have a look at physiology and ESP. There we go. Uh, low fat. And here we are with basic core IQ. Yeah. Okay. We'll head straight into psychology here. I'm Trixie. Okay, lovely. So let's look at emotion. Okay, um, so yeah, that's that's what that looks like. Low hostility, and then personal growth. That's ooh, high across the board. Basic core IQ is yep those set of stats. So we will go back to the main menu and we will have a look at central processing for anything that might care to divulge. Oh yeah, the central processing ref 4367143456-C9, which I don't think is the reference for the thing that was previously mentioned, but I I don't know if I'm accurately recalling that or not. Um, this is this is also classified. Oh now home is excited, okay. Satlink Sable, Regent, Protector, Intercult Council via Geosync Relay, BNM-543, uh, Full Hollow Projection and Voice with Datacom Channel, 16 Gigabit per Second Exchange from Guangdong, parentheses Kowloon, included a direct plug central processing AI to her JAMRAS Intercorp Councilman Geneva, which seems to be in reference to uh, the bit of story that we'd just read. Homer is excited because he has a file for us. And I take it there's not anything new popped up there. No, there's not. Okay. Well, I don't know why that... So that just seems to be a reference to something that we've experienced as narrative. So I'm 
I'm very confused about the the reasons why Homer prompts a return visit. I guess perhaps uh, you're supposed to just keep checking the categories until Homer does this, um, rather than going back uh, in, a, in a rather more orderly fashion like I do. Let's have a look at Trixie's last set of stats. I'll start off uh, with logic this time. There's, there's some logic for you. So look at social adjustment. There we are. And then we'll have a look at memory. Oh, there we go. That's high, high attention span, uh, high short term memory and high learning capacity. Uh, slightly worse long term memory. Um, right. And then we will have a look at basic core IQ the last uh, set of stats that are assessed there, art being the highest of those, and then well, let's find out what Homer would like to say. We're coming Homer. Okay, narrative one, so this is more Homer driven. Homer's perspective on uh, what's happening. This was in the summer of 2080. Vegas 26 had already changed course. Okay, well, uh, this is in reference to the the laser beam thing that Regent Sable wanted to do. Uh, oh, we're back with Peter Devor in this segment though. Secure tent and crawler. His thin, distorted voice spoke into the cavernous silence of the Antarctic dawn. Peter and the others huddled closer, listening. The records were old and occasional errors had crept into the data, so some words were warped out of recognition or gone altogether. It's a bit like me trying to read this out. Went to check radar and found that it had scanned what seemed to be a strange anomaly under the ice. I wanted to make one more pass to confirm what I thought must be a recording error, but the wind came up suddenly and I had to retreat to the tent. Well, that was thrilling. Okay, so they found, I don't know, Jules Sorrell's uh, audio recording? Well, that wasn't. Oh. Well, that was it. That's what you called me back here for. Oh, well, there you go. That's the end of another episode. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, the, the the highlight very much was near the beginning of this episode. Thank you very much for joining me for a um, another episode of uh, slightly begrudging narrative progression. I hope you'll join me again as we um, we inch by inch uh, claw our way towards some kind of conclusion for this story. Um, and until next time, take care. Bye-bye.